Uh, it is time now, though, for our uh, feature presentation. Uh, so counting trucks for environmental justice data from the ground up. Um, for those of you who are interested in environmental justice, um, air pollution is like a huge thing, uh, especially in Chicago. And most cities have this problem, but Chicago I'm sure has its own special version of it. Um, so really uh, excited to uh, hear from our presenters tonight about this um, awesome work that they've been doing. Um, so yeah, if, uh, Carolina and uh, Paulina, you want to come on, uh, turn your cameras on, and uh, I think you have some slides, uh, please uh, take it away and welcome. Thank you, Derek. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. So my name is Paulina Vaca. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an associate on the Urban Resilience Team at CNT, which stands for Center for Neighborhood Technology. We're also a 501c nonprofit based in Chicago, but we do work nationwide. And we create a lot of innovative tools, like you're about to see um, the Chicago Truck Data Portal, and we help make cities work for everyone. I'll go ahead and pass it to my teammate. Uh, hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> my name is Carolina Macias. I use she, they pronouns. And I am the Senior Mobility Justice Research Organizer with El Bejo, the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. We like big titles. Um, and yeah, El Bejo has been doing environmental justice work um, in Little Village and across the city for about 30 years now. Um, and so we're really excited to talk to you all about the truck count data portal uh, that we worked with CNT on. And also I'm recovering from a cough, so excuse me um, if I cough throughout the uh, presentation here. I appreciate the grace. Uh, next slide. And okay, so we wanted to give you all a bit of a roadmap for today's talk. Uh, first of all, we briefly wanted to outline the key issues that communities face in relation to truck traffic and its impact to their well-being. Um, we also want to give you some local historical context that led us to the creation of the truck data portal. We'll be sharing some high level project goals that we outlined as well as the different ways in which the data has been used so far. Um, and then we'll really get into the nitty gritty of the presentation where you'll be able to learn more about the findings and the methods of the project before we wrap up with some Q&A. Um, next slide. Um, so we thought it was important to start off by sharing uh, the framework that we use to guide this project, mobility justice. Um, mobility justice, as defined by our comrades um, at Equiticity, is the ability for all marginalized people to move freely and safely through our communities and cities without the fear of state, institutional, or systemic violence. Um, this includes not just the threat of police violence, but also interpersonal violence and vehicular violence. Um, so whether you're walking, biking, or taking public transit. At its core, mobility justice is about ensuring that people, especially those from marginalized groups, can travel without the constant worry of harm or barriers. This framework is essential because it reminds us that mobility isn't just about transportation infrastructure, it's about addressing the social and systemic forces that restrict freedom of movement for many, uh, many folks in our communities. So as we look at the impacts of diesel pollution and the larger transportation sector, it's critical that we consider how these systems affect mobility for all, especially those in environmental justice communities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as we began this project, uh, we took a step back to consider the key issues that communities face regarding truck traffic. Uh, this helped us pinpoint some specific problems that our data could address. First, we looked at the health impacts of diesel pollution. We recognize that diesel exhaust is significantly more toxic than gasoline. Uh, studies show that it can be up to 100 times more harmful. Um, with the increase in heavy truck traffic, we recognize the serious risk that it presents for it presents for pedestrians and cyclists. 
Uh, these groups often lack adequate protections on our roads and the presence of trucks complicates their safety. Um, for instance, um, we heard from many residents in Little Village that live near streets with high truck activity that they fear crossing certain intersections. Um, and many would rather take longer routes or wait for a ride from a relative just to do basic tasks like grocery shopping or laundry. Um, we also focused on the fact that um, environmental justice communities are situated in industrial corridors and sacrifice zones and often bear the heaviest burden of diesel pollution. And lastly, we recognize the ongoing growth of the transportation distribution and logistics center driven by our status as a major uh, freight hub. So while this growth presents economic opportunities for the region, it often occurs without considering the cumulative impacts on neighborhoods that are already overburdened. Next slide. And so we wanted to give you some historical context here on um, the story behind the, the truck count data portal. So back in 2016, parents from Zapata Academy, a pre-K to eighth grade school in Little Village, uh, raised serious concerns about Unilever's plans to expand its Hellman's mayonnaise factory and distribution center, which was located just a few feet away from the school. Um, this expansion was expected to bring a about an additional 500 to 900 trucks per day. And it raised significant health and safety risks for, for residents. Um, residents were worried that the influx of trucks would affect the safety and well being of children in the surrounding community. So, in response, El Vejo Youth initiated a community science project focused on truck county. At the beginning of the 2017 school year, students from an AP statistics class at Infinity High School began, began a truck counting project as well with the support of their teacher and um, El Vejo staff. Their findings were very telling. Um, an average of one truck passed through the intersection of 31st and Costner every minute. So this intersection is the intersection um, where the high school sits. So, Unfortunately, the city invalidated the hand, uh, hand counts uh, conducted by the students and they approved the expansion. Um, we know that current data, truck data from the city is very limited. If you actually head over to CDOT's website, you'll see that their average daily truck counts um, is from 2006. That's nearly 20 years ago. Um, so the lack of data makes it difficult for us to fully understand the impact of truck traffic in our communities. And this data gap is critical. We need accurate localized information to advocate effectively for our community safety. Um, and so this is why ongoing data collection efforts, like the one that we're, we're sharing with you today, um, are so important. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as we gathered concerns from community, it became very clear that lived experiences alone were not enough to prompt action from the city. We needed uh, to back these stories with hard data to demonstrate the scale of the problem. So tying quantifiable numbers to these lived experiences was crucial. We set out to count as many intersections and street segments as our founding allowed ensuring that we captured the most accurate picture of truck traffic in environmental justice communities. Our goal was to make this data open access accessible so residents, policymakers, city agencies, and, the, and departments understood the impact of truck traffic. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so the ways in which um, our data has been used through different initiatives. Um, one of them is through the Neighbors for Equitable Transition to Zero Emissions, NetZ. Uh, this campaign is part of the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition, and our data has informed our advocacy for reducing diesel pollution and cleaner transportation 
um, across the state. And another one that I want to highlight is uh, the work in Archer Heights. Our data has supported local efforts to secure industrial and safety improvements, especially in areas with heavy truck traffic. Uh, by using this local data, we were able to highlight the need for better infrastructure to protect residents uh, who walk and bike in these high risk zones. Next slide, please. And yeah, these are uh, some of the media attention uh, that we've received. Uh, we've linked all these articles in the talk description. So after today's uh, conversation, if you have time um, and are interested, we invite you to visit those articles, read more about it. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll move on to our findings. Next slide. Awesome. So it's my turn now. Thank you, Carol, for beautifully laying out um, all of the frameworks and context that led up to this. So now we're going to really get into the nitty gritty of what the data showed us and how we're tying it to lived experience. So next up, I'm going to do a quick high level walkthrough of the portal. I could easily spend the entire presentation just on this, but I'll only do a couple of minutes here and just go over key takeaways. So this is a web page housed on CNT's website, um, Chicago Truck Counts.cnt.org, and it's all just one page you can keep scrolling through. And a lot of what Gatto explained already is what you see here in these drop downs. And I'll just jump to the data itself. So there's different ways that we showcase and visualize these truck and bus numbers. Again, medium and heavy duty traffic that runs on diesel, which again is up to 100 times more toxic to the human body than gas. So this map that you see here, it's really cool to me. So each dot that you see represents one out of over 30 locations that we counted truck and bus traffic. And um, each spot, it's just for one day. So in the traffic counting world, um, there's something called ADT, that's average daily traffic. So we consulted um, Cindy Fish, um, shout out to her, she's done great work. And she would deploy cameras on a typical weekday, a very normal Tuesdays. I think there was one Wednesday. Um, and the larger the dot you see, the larger the volume of truck and bus traffic. So I can click on the largest dot here, and it shows you a lot of information. Um, in bold up here, the exact number of trucks and buses, um, the intersection it was at, the date, and some demographics, which is really important to showcase again, because there's like a disparate burden of high truck traffic, high bus traffic in communities of color, which are in industrial quarters in the city. And you can zoom in. And I really encourage y'all, if you haven't already, to take some time to explore this further. Again, it's linked in the description of this talk. And something that's also really cool is you can see here, you can toggle on a something that's called a cumulative impacts map. Now there's different versions of this, and this one is unique because it factors in more variables regarding freight and logistics, for example, proximity to um, intermodal rail yards, for example. And it's a five point system. So one is the least burdened, five being the most. So you see here the red, you see a lot of it in the Southwest, West, um, South and Southeast sides of Chicago. Um, so unsurprising to see where we decided to locate a lot of the cameras happens to be, you know, in these red areas, um, also some North side control groups. And again, I encourage you to explore more. It really um, goes into detail in this description here. And there's also a methodology section if you wanted to even understand the math behind creating the, the colorful cumulative impacts map that you see. So I'll scroll down. So that's one way that we're showcasing the data. Another way too is this report section here. So each of these areas that you see in blue, that is the official community area name of the location that we counted. So I'll give an example. Let's go to South Lawndale. And these are the locations that we counted in that community. It tells you that these were all intersections and you can click on one. Let's do Glasky and 31st. You'll see here that there's three different types of reports per area. 
And these are, it's all the same data. It's just shown in slightly different ways. Now, if you really wanted the raw data in a spreadsheet form, you could see it in an Excel here. And this is actually what our urban analytics team at CNT used to create the map that I just showed you and another chart that I'll show you soon. But something that I like is the summary report. It's a little more user-friendly. So it shows you here the location, the date, and an aerial shot of where exactly we counted, some information on what exactly we mean by intersection count, some photographs here of the area. If you keep scrolling down, this is the real nitty gritty information. Now I know it's a lot of information to intake at once. It did take me a good while to fully wrap my head around this when I first saw it myself. Um, and again, all this information here is what we use to visualize in the um, map that I showed you. And each column here represents a cardinal location. So this is going south, west, north, and east. And it's split hour by hour. So again, these were 24 hour counts. And here you can see each hour what the total movement of all traffic was. And I'm saying, you know, pedestrians to bikes, to cars, to trucks. And here in the bottom, it disaggregates it for you on the total amount of lights. And in the portal, we provide a very clear definition of what exactly that means. And same with trucks, the type of classes. Articulated trucks, it just means heavy duty, you know, tractor, trailer, single unit. And, you know, that just means medium duty, you know, just like one unit of a, of a truck. And on the end here, you see the total. And if you keep scrolling down, then it just gives you like, instead of a, the 24 hour picture, it'll give you, you know, just for the morning or the evening. Um, I won't, won't spend too much time on this. But just wanted to show you uh, what we provide um, for people who want to use this information. And scrolling down here, this is the last visualization that we offer. I think it's easier to see just one community area at a time. So we go to McKinley Park. And similar to the chart I showed you, it just shows you hour by hour the amount of truck and bus traffic for the locations that we counted. And I think this is really helpful because you can compare different locations really visually easily. And you can even see the peak hour. I'm just looking at the highest point on the charts. So you see here, um, the hour of 11 a.m., there was over 300. And the, yeah, the rest below is, again, context that Caro already laid out for us. And again, I just really want to emphasize how all these numbers, it's you know, it's technically no information, but it's not surprising for a lot of people who have been living or working or just exist in these areas that have a lot of industry and commercial activity. And something that I do want to emphasize, too, is how we do have um, a good handful of quotes in this portal to emphasize just that. So this is a really great quote here um, from Tony Isha. She, you know, um, born from the south side of Chicago. And she lives with asthma, and a lot of people that she grew up with um, also has to deal with that. So understanding how, you know, unnormalizing that, you know, health, public health crisis, and um, how a part of the solution for that is electrifying these vehicles so they don't emit local air pollution. Okay, so that's a, a peek into the portal. I'll go back into our presentation. I know it's a lot of information and I'm about to show more, but don't worry, at the end, we'll definitely have time for reflection and more Q&A. So let's get into more of how we decided where exactly to count trucks. A lot of thought and critical thinking went into this. Um, but just to give a brief understanding. Um, again, we really wanted to count areas that are uh, the biggest industrial quarters in the city. So that's in the Southwest and Southeast sides and areas that generally have a lot of truck traffic, you know, think of highways, but also trucks in proximity to people. So think of parks, schools, residential areas, um, areas where, again, Ricardo said, um, where El Vaco had counted trucks in 2016, so we can do a full comparison. And not only did we want to count, you know, in certain intersections, um, but we also wanted to count at specific industries themselves. So one data limitation of our numbers 
is that, you know, we have all these numbers, but we can't necessarily easy, easily attribute it to a truck generator, um, except for when we place some of the cameras in the driveways of known truck generators. So most of the counts that we collected are just intersection counts, but a good handful we counted um, specifically at, you know, Norfolk Southern Intermodal Terminal, for example, um, BNSF. So again, these are intermodal rail yards where so many goods um, that come on trains are transferred onto trucks for, um, you know, the logistics side of the supply chains. And then we also wanted some control groups in the north side just to compare. Um, so some communities of color up there, but also some predominantly um, white areas as well. And in order to make this a valid comparison, um, we wanted to count areas on the north side that we saw would have higher truck and bus traffic as well, because the areas that we were counting in the southwest, southeast sides, for example, were areas that we assumed would also have higher truck traffic. Okay, so that's the methodology, aka the thought process. So how is the actual methods um, in which we collected the data? So again, Cindy Fish from Fish Transportation, um, rock star in deploying the cameras. So what you see here is a pole mount. Now, Cindy, she would go to an intersection that we decided we wanted to count at and find, you know, a traffic pole, a road sign, something where she could mount this, um, this pole. And at the tip top you see here is the camera. And she'd have to make sure it's like an unobstructed view. And this hardware, it's called MyoVision, but it's also a software because at the end of a full 24 hour period, um, the camera and the SD card would be uploaded online, where then, you know, some data technicians would process the information and then showcase it for us in some, um, you know, raw footage and the charts um, that I showed you. And this was only available to us and our team, which is why we wanted to upload it onto CNT's website so that anyone could see it for free. Um, also just want to emphasize how, you know, very easy for me just having Cindy deploy this for us, but for her, she definitely had to be very thoughtful, you know, bad weather for rain, um, some interse intersections that we wanted to count at, we couldn't because there was construction or viaducts in the way. And um, one last thing here, that's to me, it's a fun fact, is how you actually don't need a permit to even do this. Um, although you do need to go through, as Cindy says, like uh, safety training, um, that's recommended just because, you know, it can be dangerous intentionally going to these high traffic areas and then, um, you know, installing something. Okay, so before I get more into numbers, I'm just going to show 15 seconds of a compilation video that I made of uh, each location. And you can find the full video on the portal itself. And this doesn't have audio, um, but I just really want you to show or focus on people in proximity to the high traffic areas. And this all looks very normal for a lot of people, but I think it's also really important to unnormalize a lot of um, high traffic locations. Okay, I'll pause here, just so you get a sense of the footage that we have. Okay, so next couple of slides before the Q&A, just getting into some data snapshots. So I already shared um, this count with y'all. This was the highest count that we had. It was over 5,000 trucks and buses at the intersection of Pulaski and 41st in Archer Heights. And something that is also really insightful to understand, and you can glean this um, in the summary reports, is also the number of bicyclists and pedestrians. Again, this really paints a picture of people in proximity to high truck traffic, which goes into the understanding of you know, how to, or like the problem that is in the way of achieving mobility justice as Garo so um, eloquently explained earlier. And also it's insightful just to see the peak hour as well and how many um, trucks and buses were. So that's over 400 in an hour, which is a lot. Um, so then this and the next couple graphs 
This is not available on the portal because I actually made it for a community engagement event, um, the People's Town Hall hosted by the Southeast Environmental Task Force. Um, it's the same information though, just I just visualized it in a very user-friendly way. Um, so you see here, it's nearly 3,000 you know, trucks and buses in one day, also keeping in mind you know, how many pedestrian and um, bicyclists there are. So same thing here, um, over 1,000, but then you see it's nearly 2,000 pedestrians. So again, just really painting the picture of people walking close to so much emissions and you know how that affects them, you know, short term, long term, et cetera. Okay, this is the last um, graph that I have for y'all. Um, and I think this really helps to bridge the understanding of the disparate impact that a lot of communities of color face regarding this specific type of pollution. So this is showing um, the percentage of medium and heavy duty traffic to all traffic. Um, so you see in the bottom here, there's different community areas. So again, I made this for um, the People's Town Hall for the, um, the Southeast Environmental Task Force. And you see that um, Lincoln Park and West Town, they were the only two um, predominantly white community areas that we counted on the north side, you see it's 65 to 80%. Um, and these are all the locations that we counted on the southeast side, um, Riverdale, east side, South Deering, Hegwish, and South, um, yes, <laughs> that's them. Um, and that's 60 to nearly 100% people of color. Um, so we see here, Lincoln Park, West Town, both had, um, and this is rounded to the nearest whole number, 4% of all traffic in a given day was medium and heavy duty. And you see going from, you know, Riverdale to this one in Hegwish, these different intersection counts, it ranges from five to 10%. Um, so I'd say that's significantly more. And then you go here to um, in the intersection at Torrance and 126, and then also the counts that we collected on the driveways of the Norfolk Southern Rail Yard. And it's 37 to three fourths <laughs> Um, medium and heavy duty traffic. Mind you, the national average uh, is around 7%. Um, so the latter ones here are like astronomically above that. And I'll let y'all sit with this for a little bit longer, but this is the final slide. And I'm sure there's a lot of questions that you'll have um, we're getting into our Q&A section. All right, excellent. Um, thank you both so much. Uh, as you can maybe see in the chat, there are many questions. Um, so for folks who um, have not had a chance to ask them yet, uh, go ahead and type in the chat. If you do have a question, we'll try to get through all of them roughly in the order that they were um, asked. I have a few questions myself, but we will give priority to you all. Um, the very first question is, are there any city or government initiatives to gather this kind of data, or are there political pressures not to gather this data, uh, as in using government infrastructure to gather it? Not that I'm aware of that there's any city government initiatives to gather this kind of data. And part of the purpose to do this in the first place is to was to show a model of what the city could and should be doing, um, because we're fairly small nonprofits, CNT and El Beco. So, you know, us using our resources to create something at this scale, it's in our way of putting a little bit of pressure on them and, and showing them. But yeah, no, no, nothing that I'm aware of. Um, Caro, do you know of anything yourself? Yeah, no. Um, I mean, see, that was to some extent um, a partner of ours in this project. Um, but you know, like Paulina said, we're we're hoping that this will motivate and encourage different city agencies and departments to take a step further. Um, we obviously have the technology for it, right? And so I think. Uh, we're we're hoping that this can lead to ongoing conversations and action as well from from city and hopefully from the state as well. Great. Uh, the next question is: um, Someone would love to hear more about how the pollution and its effects are compounded with the historical industrialization of these neighborhoods. Yeah, that's a 
Um, I think we can geek out on, on that one for sure. Um, I mean, Chicago has over 20 industrial corridors, right? And we know that many of them are located in poor um, and communities of color. And so they have historically been, um, you know, located in poor neighborhoods, right? We know that before white flight, um, a lot of these industrial corridors were um, next to the homes and employment of a lot of the first um, immigrants into, into the city. And so European immigrants into the city. Um, and so that has, that pattern has continued the increased pollution. Um, we, back in 2019, um, CMAP started uh, a modernization project for the Little Village Industrial Corridor. However, that was soon paused. And so we're still waiting to, to continue those conversations, right? There's increasing amount of warehouses being uh, proposed and developed um, along our corridor. And unfortunately, we don't have an updating um, industrial corridor plan. We also don't have um, a cumulative impacts ordinance. We don't have a lot of these things that could potentially help us um, think about how do we continue to industrialize or stop the industrialization um, of our of our communities that are already overburdened by industry. And I think on one of your earlier slides, you I think I saw the term sacrifice zones used. I actually, I mean, I think that sounds related to what you're talking about, about here, but I actually have never heard that phrase used before. I guess, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on what that is or what that means? Yeah, it's a term that a lot of um, environmental justice communities are using um, to define uh, their reality, right? Folks feel like they are being sacrificed for the for economic growth. Um, they're being sacrificed for the movement of goods. And so, you know, while we're experiencing um, disparities uh, related to health, we're also experiencing disparities related to economic um, opportunities as well. And so, you know, we we really feel like we are the dumping grounds um, of, of our society. And so we wanna call it that, we wanna name it um, so that we can have an honest conversation. Thanks. That's a it's a powerful term. So I think it like it helps to like paint that picture um in a much clearer way. Uh I think the next question I see here is um from Howard. Did you collect data over multiple days for an intersection or is this a one-day snapshot? It's a one-day snapshot. So off the top of my mind, it was April to September was the period in which we collected this information, but um per location it was just over one day. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and Felipe asks, uh, were you able to get data from the intermodal transfer site on 79th uh, Street between Western and Kedzie and or Damon Avenue um, truck corridor north of the north branch of the Chicago River? I'm not sure if I saw that on the map or not. Um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Let me go back to the portal. Yeah, I'm uh, curious to see like, maybe there's a closer location that we got um, I don't think we got that exact intersection. Okay. Um, yeah, I definitely remember all the intersection names off the top of my mind. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, well, if we do it again, uh, I guess that's maybe a, a data point to maybe consider for another location. Um, we have a growing list, so if oh, you okay. know, folks want to add to it, drop it on in the chat, and you know, maybe maybe we will we'll, we will get to it eventually. Okay, and actually, that that's actually a good segue to a question that I had, which is that. So it sounds like are you you do plan to do this again? Is that is it like a is it going to be like a recurring thing, or what are your plans to do more of these truck counts? Um, yeah, unfortunately. Oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> we can both answer this. Um, so I know we collected one more count that's not on the website. Um, that was in North Lawndale, which we do plan on uploading it then. Um, and this was a couple months ago but yeah we we're actually applying for more funding to collect just a little bit more truck numbers 
we've been doing a lot of reflecting on like, okay, we have all this data and it's like, should we just keep collecting more? Um, but we're, we've been on pause and realizing the need to even make this information further accessible, especially for community engagement events. And even the, th and the need arose too from talking with our partners on how to further tie these numbers to air pollution emissions. So I know CNT has been thinking a lot about um, calculating an average of converting these truck numbers into like average emissions. Mm -hmm. So we have applied for funding for that, but obviously have to wait to see if we received it or not. Um, but got anything to add there? No, no, I think you summarized it perfectly. Right. Um, and to put this question oh. quickly, I, yeah, I don't think we counted that location. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, Michael's question is related to Howard's question. Um, uh, you mentioned that you collected data on Tuesdays. Can you say more about why you chose that particular day of the week? Um, were there discussions to collect over other weekdays or on weekends or even, I guess, holidays or something like that for that matter? Yeah, so we intentionally, and by we, I mean, um, CNT Lebeco as led by um, Fish Transportation Group because she is, has been in like the traffic world for quite a long time for several decades and like her recommendation is like for average daily traffic that's calculated on like Tuesdays or Thursdays mm -hmm. like in that world that's just the chosen two days that it's just like very average so you're not going to have like an outlier day, like a holiday, for example, Black Friday, which would be very insightful to know the amount of data. But if you just want, if you want a general snapshot, like you, we intentionally avoided holidays or even weekends. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, how do you process the videos to get the vehicle counts? Um, does the city have similar video data that could also be analyzed? So the video is processed through MyoVision. So this was something that, again, our consultant, she would upload the video, MyoVision would do the processing, and then we just immediately, well, not immediately, it would take some time. But, you know, relatively soon, we'd have access to the the counts then. So we wouldn't do the processing ourselves. Okay. Although and we would answer. And there's, so. like, software that's, like, probably, like, commercial software that you can use that, like, yeah. does that for it's you, awesome. like, probably computer vision stuff. Yeah, it's not AI, which I learned. Um, okay. So it's just different. It's just in softwares, yes. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I'm curious how it works. I mean, I could see um, someone could just sit there and like count, but or maybe there's like an algorithm that's like looking for particular like patterns and shapes in the video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a person, and then they also have. I don't know how to explain it, but like a, a software tool that also yeah. analyzes it for them. So several measures to confirm. It's like 95 um, plus or minus accuracy. Oh, great. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Sam asks, are traffic studies required for new warehouse developments and would those require a truck count analysis component? No, but people are working on it. We have a lot of partners who are, I don't know if you remember the name of a bill, but um, I know the Environmental Defense Fund, for example, is leading um, bill writing for a warehousing ordinance that would require air quality monitors and a traffic um com truck traffic component okay and yeah. that would be in chicago or like statewide I or i believe I don't know. okay yeah so some um they're they are required to do a tra traffic study but like paulina said it's not specific to like truck count or truck analysis um so it's very hard to um to break it down right and really understand um the the impact or the increase influx um uh, of diesel trucks um so it would be helpful to to have a more like narrow study and analysis for that um but yeah folks are, are currently working on that okay yeah i can imagine that like this kind of work could help sort of make the argument that this is needed is that something that you've done or like plan to do and sort of trying to make that legislation happen? Yeah, so a lot of, uh, we, we are in different spaces that are working on uh, different policies, like at the city level, as well as the state level, some national as well. And so we're, we're hoping to definitely move the needle um, and have this data be something that supports those conversations as well. Um, so yes, it's 
there's currently a, a lot of work on the ground happening. Excellent. That's great. Uh, have you had, um, our next question is, yeah, have you heard much of a response from any of the companies you focus on um, where you're sort of you know, having these, these truck counts present? That's a fun question. We haven't reached out to them. They haven't reached out to us. I mean, maybe they came across us on the news, but I don't know. Um, so no to your answer or to your question. Um, okay. no. If they if they did notice, they, they haven't said anything. <laughs> Um, and do you know, uh, I guess Tess asked, do you know how far along the warehouse development ordinance is? It's currently being uh, drafted. Um, folks are, you know, working on, on language. And so unfortunately in the policy world, like things move very slowly. Um, but, you know, also we want to make sure that we get things right and that um, you know, especially impacted folks are part of the conversations and are at the table. So, yeah, you know, not sure there there's like an actual timeline on that, but um, yes, it's it's currently being drafted. Okay, great. Um, so I'm kind of, and I think that might be the last question in the chat, but I have a few more myself. Um, I think there's one from Barry. Oh, did I miss Barry's? Right above the last question. And does the city have similar video data that could also be analyzed? Oh yeah, I think we asked, did we ask that question already? Maybe we did, did we? <laughs> um, but not that I'm aware of. Okay. And I guess on that point, um, have you looked at other data sources that you could potentially um, use to sort of like sort of you know, obviously it sounds like this particular way of counting is very precise, very specific. You're literally looking at like a video feed and, and extracting data from that. Um, if your goal is to try to learn about like traffic and the and the like pollution that comes from it, have you looked at other data sources that might like get that, get at that from like maybe like a slightly less direct measure? Yeah, for sure. There's several that we looked at. So one um, data source is called Replica, so it's modeled data. So they use, um, and we have some folks at CNT that could really tell you like the real limitations of this. But from like my understanding, um, is that um, the Illinois Department of Transportation (IDOT) um, they have truck traffic, but it's only for like highways and like main arterials we call them. So it's not granular enough. So Replica uses IDOT data to model trucks. And also I think for GPS or satellite data, something on that level. Um, so it's estimates, um, which our counts are not estimates. Um, mm -hmm. They're very precise. Um, so that's replica and also it's not free. <laughs> um, and then one other thing that we looked into more was um, traffic studies at the city um conducted or like they had someone conduct for them and yeah I looked through them and some limitations there too on how a lot of them aren't like a full 24-hour picture um of the data of the traffic or like they don't separate trucks and buses from like the rest of the flow of traffic um or they're like really lengthy some of them were hundreds of pages long so it takes a lot of like bandwidth to read through them or they only show trucks and buses for, you know, the morning or like AM, PM, like peak hours is the term. So not as I think, yeah, not the full picture that is easier to talk about and understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, I'm kind of curious, um, you know, you'd mentioned that the, there's this ordinance that's being worked on that is potentially going to benefit from this data. I'm kind of curious um, what other kinds of impacts you've seen or other impacts you're sort of hoping for in both collecting and then now releasing and like making this data more accessible. Yeah, there's been a lot of different things that have popped up a little unexpectedly and surprisingly. So this was on one of the slides that Garo had, um, but I can get into it further. So for one example, um, and on our portal, we talk about 
where we want this data to go to, and like one of it's being like electrification of trucks, although that's like not the full solution, right? When you think about extraction and mining globally and environmental justice globally. Um, that's before I get too sidetracked. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the Illinois EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. They um, applied for a char federal funding, um, charging and fuel infrastructure grant. Um, this was like around a month ago. Um, and the, they were going to want to use that funding for, um, I think it's 14-ish um, medium and heavy duty electric truck charging hubs around the state. And they had cited our portal in their application. So I think that's a really great example of how our data is being used to further inform solutions. And again, really want to highlight community advocacy and how a lot of partners have just using this this data and conversations about like air pollution and how it impacts them and how it like bolsters their lived experience. Cause like again, this isn't new information for them, but like now they have something to where they can like prove it in the numbers because again, a lot of times people in power like like to invalidate um people's life. So those are just like a, a couple of examples. I'll I'll end there. Those are great. That's super encouraging to hear. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, I think I see another question in the chat from Lori. Um, how do you think about the impact of the data collection itself? For example, the risk uh, that video increases surveillance burden on these communities. Yeah, that's a, a real problem and something that I don't think we have like a full solution for. I, I did bring that up to our consultant um, earlier on in our data collection process. And um, I know some myovision cameras, um, they can have like a little descriptor of like what it is. So people know it's the, like, not tracking you. I mean, it's, it's for traffic, but, um, and she did mention how sometimes not in our case, you know, people would damage the cameras because, you know, that's their reaction to their feeling of being surveillanced. Um, but none of that happened in our project. But yeah, I think that's something very critical to not just think about, but really further mitigate. So I think in us potentially doing more traffic counts, that's something that I would really need to um, think about how to better um, work around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also imagine it, it matters like sort of what you do with the raw video data, right? Like, you know, you, do you need to keep it after you've processed it? You could sort of think about ways to minimize the potential harm if it, you know, got misplaced or someone accessed it that shouldn't have. And something that's really nice about the myovision um camera recordings, it's how it's intentionally really poor quality. <laughs> so <laughs> the other the video that was really grainy, um, that's on purpose. So the low resolution aids in privacy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that idea. I think I I think about it whenever I'm like building a website and like collecting data. It's like, do I need to collect this data? But that's taking that to the degree of like, this doesn't need to be like 4K video. No, <laughs> you gotta see our pores. Like, yeah, <laughs> we just right. Move uh, and does it even record audio, or is it just the no, video? Just video. Yeah. Okay, right. So it's just really minimally. Like, what do you need to do just what you're trying to do and nothing else, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think also, if I can add, um, you know, research has historically been very extractive. And so some conversations that we had about, like, one, how do we, especially as an EJ organization, um, want to redefine research? Um, and how do we also engage community? recognizing that like community members are researchers themselves, right? They're like constantly collecting data from their surroundings. Like for example, that story that I shared earlier or like uh, that those scenarios that community residents shared about, um, you know, taking longer routes or uh, waiting to get a ride from relatives is because they're picking up data from their surroundings, right? They understand that, you know, this is peak time. Um, this is when there's the most trucks. I'm gonna avoid this intersection. And so, um, we've had internal conversations about doing like intersection engagements, right? So if we post up the camera, um, 
let's also table, let's also have a conversation with our neighbors, with community residents, so that one, they understand what's happening. Um, and it's, you know, not an extractive practice, but we're also like building with them um, and, you know, connecting with them at a, at a, a more interpersonal level as well. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent. I think we are just at eight o'clock Chicago time. So I just wanted to say thanks again um, for uh, presenting. This is really amazing work. Um, I think we're going to be transitioning over to the civic hacking portion of the evening. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Michael as the host here. Um, but I do believe um, Paulina and Carolina, you can both maybe stick around.